<clears throat> it's a, always a pleasure to talk to people about something that you're interested in. Uh, Barry described me as a geologist and uh, my degree is actually, a, I think of myself as a chemist, as a geochemist, a chemist of the earth. And so what I'm gonna be talking about is a, a somewhat serendipitous uh, movement into things that were are secondary to my primary interest, which is where does magma come from? It, what, what happens in the earth to bring red stuff up out of a volcano? But what I'll, that's a little bit harder. Uh, I think people are often more interested in the volcanoes themselves. So that's what I'll talk about. And I'll talk especially about them being under the ocean. When UCSC was created, uh, McHenry had the good sense to recognize it would be different next to an ocean than it would have been in Merced, let's say. And so from the very early days, there's always been an, a marine or an ocean aspect of UCSC. And that's one of the reasons why I came is because half of my research life has been above sea level and half of it has been below. Um, So uh, most volcanoes on our planet uh, are under the water. And so we know relatively little about them as we know relatively little about anything that's under the oceans. And those volcanoes on earth come in three different flavors. Ones that are at the middle of oceans where plates separate. Others that are in the, in the middle of a plate like Hawaii and the third are at the edges of plates where one plate is destroyed by being pushed back into the earth at something called the subduction zone. What we know about submarine volcanoes though is rarely from being under the ocean because that's difficult to do. So we know about them by uh, rocks that are now on land but that erupted under the ocean. And we've witnessed submarine eruptions really only in the last 10 years. And we monitor underwater volcanoes only in the last few. So I'll show you results of both of those things. But I taught for all my career, most of my career, that it, when a volcano erupted under the ocean, it would be boring that you could kind of stand right next to it without fear because the weight of the sea would prevent anything exciting from happening. So here are some of the general ideas related to that. Uh, water is heavy and <clears throat> uh, about 15 times the weight of air. And the deeper you go in the ocean, the more that weight matters. So it, it the water pressure increases by uh, that one atmosphere every 10 meters or so. So right outside uh, where we're all standing uh, in Monterey, bottom of Monterey Bay, the pressure of the ocean is on, the depth is almost 500, five, almost five kilometers, 500 meters, 5,000 meters. So the pressure at the bottom of the ocean right outside uh, our windows is, is huge and you know anybody who's done uh, uh, snorkeling. If you're uh, up at the surface and you want to see something up close, so you dive down maybe five feet or 10 feet, your, your face mask often just distorts just that little bit of diving. Uh, those of us who go to sea who have children would often take with us a styrofoam cup or a styrofoam uh, head that's uh, where you put a hat or something in a store to show how it looks because just that much pressure re shrinks those things by almost a factor of 10. So we draw things on the say cup, you know, my dear uh, Emily, your daughter, and then tie it onto the bottom what you're going to send out of the bottom of the sea and it comes back so tiny that you can't read what you've written. It also destroys man-made objects. And the great fear is of human beings being in a submarine that fails because unmanned submarines have blown apart by the pressure of the ocean. So anytime that humans go down, 
they accept that risk that the same thing could happen to them. So A, the water weighs a lot, exerts a lot of pressure. It also changes the solubility of gas in a liquid. It, the more the pressure, the more gas can dissolve. That matters to scuba divers. So with, with scuba, you've got a, 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 something on your back where you're breathing in artificial air, 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. And as you dive, that mixture of gas enters your blood. The oxygen can get used, the nitrogen cannot. So the nitrogen just stays there. And the longer you're down and the deeper you go, the more the nitrogen is in your blood. That's okay until you come back to the surface because as you ascend, that gas comes out of the blood. It makes bubbles. And having bubbles floating around in your circulatory system is not good. And so people can die from the bends where those bubbles have come out of their blood because they've ascended too quickly. For the same reason, bubbles are not expected in magma that's deep in the ocean. And as that magma comes back toward the surface, as it decompresses, bubbles form, bubbles nucleate, and bubbles grow, just like in blood. And, and it's a, another good analogy is a carbonated beverage, a, a can of beer, a can of soda, something like that. As long as the top is on the bottle, as long as the top is on the can, all of the carbon dioxide is happily in your soda or in your beer, but you rip off the top, you release the pressure and all of a sudden it foams, a Guinness beer. The same thing, those pictures you saw a week or two ago of uh, San Vincent in um, the, the Soufriere, the volcano in the southern end of the uh, uh, Antilles uh, with this eruption cloud that went up uh, 20,000 feet or so, that was taking the top off the can of beer. That was all the gas that was in the magma happily sitting there, all of a sudden released in pressure. So what happens under the ocean? So you've probably seen uh, maps like this before of plate tectonics. So let me... So things like on this diagram where it says Pacific plate or North American plate. So those are big portions of the Earth's surface internal to which not much happens. And most of the earthquakes, most of the volcanoes are at the boundaries between those plates. So on this map, all the little red dots are volcanoes. And happily over my 50 years, I've been to basically all of the places on this map where there's a lot of red dots to study the volcanoes. But here, along say this black line, this Eastern edge of the Pacific plate, it's where the, it's where the crust of the most of 70% of the planet is formed. It's, it's oceanic crust, what's underneath the ocean is formed at all these little black lines and they're all volcanoes. So the crust of most of the earth is formed by volcanoes in the, in the Atlantic is literally in the middle, hence called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And it's forming that ocean crust that has pushed South America away from Africa. But it's all volcanoes and therefore most volcanoes on the planet are submarine and we don't see them. So how do you see them? So these, whoops, these are, these are the kind of gadgets that uh, people like me use to study them. In the upper left is one you may have read or seen about before, it's called Alvin. It was, it's a submarine with people that can go inside it that for oh, 70 years now, has been uh, exploring the floor of the ocean. It's the one that found the Titanic, for example. So I used it, I went in that 
to dive into volcanoes uh, south of, be between Japan and um, in the Western Pacific. A, a much safer way to do it is here in the top right, so that uh, this is a unmanned submersible that is tethered, that little, Alvin, when it goes down, there's no connection to the surface. You're on your own. Uh, you have to learn how to get home in case something happens to the pilot. Uh, for the, the unmanned submersible, there's a wire that connects it to the surface, but it allows uh, the, the, this unmanned thing to act as a robot on the seafloor. This one is uh, built and maintained by M. Bari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Not the aquarium in Monterey, but the research institute that's in Moss Landing. And it's the world's uh, only, mainly, uh, main privately funded oceanographic research institute. And it's funded by the legacy and the, the uh, philanthropy of David Packard of Hewlett-Packard. So they built this thing, and because Packard was an engineer, these folks at Ambari are really good as uh, designing and building things. So a lot of what I'm going to show you are things that I have done with them. The lower left is um, the control room of the Ambari ship. So instead of going down to the seafloor, you sit in this dark room with a joystick and tell the robot what you want it to do. The bottom right over here is, I'm gonna get this pointer back. The bottom right over here is a drilling ship, like an oil derrick drill ship. That, that derrick in the, in the middle of it is around 200 feet high. And it sends uh, drills right through the center of the ship. So the center of the ship is open and the drill can go all the way down to the floor of the ocean and drill into the floor of the ocean. So I'll show you some pictures toward the end where we drilled, the, the ship was 2000 meters above the floor of the ocean and we drilled 2000 meters into the floor of the ocean to collect stuff. So these are all different ways to see what's on the floor of the ocean. And what's it like actually to, to do it? So here's, this is the back end of, of a oceanographic vessel. There is one of these unmanned uh, submersibles called ROPOS. And it's being sent to the floor of the ocean to extract a, uh, a geophysical instrument. I'll show you the results of, from this instrument that was deployed on the floor of the ocean when an eruption occurred. And the lava, froze the instrument on the floor of the ocean. It couldn't come back. So now this uh, robot has gone down to the floor of the ocean to pull the poor instrument off the floor of the ocean and bring it home. And it's, it's just interesting in some ways So here it is breaking the sea surface. And all of this work like this is done with heavy equipment. It's um, to, people in order to be safe have to know, have eyes in the back of their heads, whoops, uh, know what everybody else is doing. No. Um, it's, it's quite exciting, I mean, all that to say. Now, some of you may have ever gone to the big island of Hawaii and down on the, the south coast and watched lava come downhill. Um, if I close that, oh, I, all right, I'll forget about the laser pointer. Uh, watch lava come downhill and flow into the ocean uh, from the land to the sea. And this is how I think most of us have thought about what it's like for magma, for eruptions to be uh, uh, under the ocean. And here, if, if you're brave, you can swim, oh, within 
20 feet of this lava fall quite safely. It's noisy, but nothing is exploding. Nothing dramatic is happening. If you're a fish, it's not so good, but for humans to see it, it doesn't matter. But why it is that way is that it's already degassed. Whatever gas was in this stuff came out uh, on land, and it's, it's now going into the sea. And what it forms when you're there uh, scuba diving next to Hawaii is stuff that looks like these things in the bottom left of the photograph. And they're called pillow lavas. They're long tubes. It's like oh, taking a toothpaste and squirting out the toothpaste from the container and it makes this long sinuous ridge. Uh, so, and they're called pillow lavas. Here's actually one on, as the cover of a pillow. The, the top right picture here is if you, if you are driving from um, uh, Santa Rosa over to the coast in Marin County, there's a, a, a reservoir there called the Nicosia Reservoir. And this is at the dam. So these are students I've taken on a trip. And if you look really carefully here, you'll see little circular things that the students are looking at. So that's now on land, and that's how most of geology knows about submarine volcanoes is going to places like the Nicosia Dam Reservoir. The bottom left, though, are pictures taken on the floor of the ocean by one of those submersibles. And so this is what we, until recently, thought submarine volcanism was. It was pillow lava and that that's all you'd get. It would be, uh, and that was the characteristics, that's how you would know that what you were looking at had formed under the ocean and that deeper than 500 meters uh, there would be nothing else than that. And here's some, oops, Here's some video footage. And if I hope this is that your room is dark enough that you can see this. So this is looking out the window of uh, a submersible. Those flashes you just saw is where it's taking a photograph. But look really carefully. Uh, again, let me get a pointer. Where I'm looking right now, see here on the edge of these things, A, they're semicircular. Here, here's a good one. It's a nice flat piece of what came out of your toothpaste tube. But that ridge along the edge, each of these has a oh, centimeter or so ridge, is glass. It looks like obsidian. And it's where what was here, magma, that red stuff that is a thousand degrees centigrade, is hitting ocean water that's four degrees centigrade, and it's chilling. It's freezing right at that edge. So it's hot and, and still plastic and molten on the inside, but rigid and glassy on the outside. And now look deeper in here. See all those little black areas kind of in the middle of the pillows. Those are where gas bubbles are coming out of the magma. These are all holes that are called vesicles. And uh, say in a building supply store here in Santa Cruz, you could buy for your rock garden what they sell as holy lava not H-O-L-Y lava, but H-O-L-E-Y lava with holes in it. Well, the holes are where the gas used to be and has come out of the liquid, just like the nitrogen out of blood. Well, now once we had those tools to go look at the seafloor, not everything is pillow lava. These things up at the top, the top two, you can see are sort of like those pillows, but they're now squished. They're elongate. And if you've walked, walked on the surface, say, in Hawaii, there's what they call pahoehoe, which is groovy and flat, and that doesn't rip up your shoes. 
But then the bottom of these things are sheety, all the, the word sheet. So almost like slate. And they're just very thin pieces of lava, one on top of the other. And the bottom left, there's a, a sea star uh, living. And this is where lava flowed underneath this frozen carapace. And the lava is flowing either to us or away from us in this photograph. And that's all empty. The lava has gone somewhere else. And what it's left behind are all these sheets of individual things that have um, flowed so fast that they've <coughs> made uh, not pillows, but things that people had just basically not seen until before that. So there's lots of different kinds of seafloor lava. Now look, this is, these are more pictures, and those are the depths, 2165 meters below sea level, 2,000 meters down. And here's these pillow lavas with things growing on them. Now look at all this black stuff, where my pointer is. It's, it's sandy. It's uh, like the grains of sand on the Santa Cruz seashore, except it's black, just like the black sand beaches in Hawaii. Or here's a close up. Here's those sheety lavas. And on top of it is this fine dusting of white stuff. So if, all, if the only way you have to sample things is to bring back big pieces of rock, you would never even know this was there. And it was only discovered about 20 years ago at Ambari when one of the scientists went to one of the engineers and said, gee, do you think you could build a vacuum cleaner that would work at the bottom of the ocean where the pressure is so great that it crushes things? And the engineer said, wow, that's just exactly the kind of thing I like to do. So they went away and they created the vacuum cleaner. And the scientists took the vacuum cleaner down and brought back that fine stuff. Well, it turns out that, <clears throat> that there can be meters thick piles of that fine stuff. And it can go kilometers away from where those pillow lavas were. And most of it is made up of fine glass shards that don't have many, that many vesicles in them, don't have many bubbles. They're quite small, 500 microns. That's one half of a millimeter. And these particular examples come from those mid-ocean ridges. And therefore, there is explosive stuff that's happening, not just these lavas, but it's exploding enough to create these fine glass shards that had been previously unknown. Now, here's the one technical slide for those of you who are into the nitty gritty of geology, or in this case, geochemistry. Um, there's three different symbols on here. B bear with me a bit. This, uh, this, this is not going to be difficult to understand. But there's, th these are all little bits of rock materials, the kind of thing I do for a living, from Hawaii. The, the triangles, are little bits of glass, or data from little bits of glass inside a mineral. And the, the circles are those little shards of glass picked up in things like that vacuum cleaner. And the diagrams at the top, this, that's silica dioxide on the one hand, or sodium dioxide and potassium dioxide, or the, this is a relation of the magnesium to iron ratio of things, they're, they're chemical, measurements about those little bits of glass. And so the, all of these things would be called basalt. So these are kind of subtle little differences, but there are differences in the chemical composition of these things. But the bottom left diagram is the water content on the x-axis and carbon dioxide, two gases. And this is the measurement of how much water or how much CO2 is left in that glass. Bubbles may have formed, and this is what's like how much nitrogen is still in the diver's blood when they come back. 
And here's a, a, a cartoon of something going from eight or nine kilometers underneath Hawaii up to half a kilometer from the surface. So here's magma rising up in the ocean. And what happens to its gas content? Well, you can see that the, the things that were included in a mineral, so they had a, a mineral around them, the gas couldn't go anywhere, that that has quite high CO2 and the highest water content. And that the little glass shards have a lot less. So the, the idea, and it, you can't see it very well, I apologize, but up here at the top where my cursor is right now, there's a dashed line labeled 80 millipascals. So that's a unit of pressure. So this is high pressure at the top. And there's one down here at the bottom, which is 10 megapascals. Uh, low pressure at the bottom. Remember, pressure increases the amount of gas, just like the, for the scuba diver. So the magma contains water and carbon dioxide and sulfur. Those are things that can become a gas. The amount that it maintains is a function of pressure. So as something comes to the surface, those, those volatile elements leave the liquid, leave the magma, and become bubbles. So people like me uh, use the chemical characteristics of this stuff to try to in infer what happens as magma rises and can you predict, therefore, uh, what's going to happen at the surface? Will there be an explosion? Won't there be an explosion? All right, so here's an example from Hawaii. Uh, the, here's the big island of Hawaii, the upper left. But when you're standing on that south coast of the big island, looking out to sea, what you're not seeing because the ocean is in the way is the next island of Hawaii still forming. It's called Loihi. It's huge. It's 3,000 meters high off the seafloor, but the top is still a thousand meters below sea level. That's why you don't know it's there. But here's a map that's been made of the seafloor where these colors are shown on the right for water depth. The, the purples are deep water, the, uh, the reddish colors are shallow water. So here is Loihi. It has a hole in the middle that's called a caldera, just like so the same thing is true at Kilauea. Kilauea has rift zones that go toward the east and toward the southwest, so does Loihi. It actually is known to have erupted about 25 years ago, but no one could get there in time to see it. But what this is what it looks like afterwards. Here are those pillow lavas. They have almost no bubbles left, no vesicles left. But around them, there's quite a lot of these small shards of things. And they're called this word clasts. And uh, a big class that's of two to four microns is called a lapillus and things smaller are, are called ash. So Luihi is mostly pillow lava, but there is some of this stuff if you have the means to collect it. But then at, the mid, at a mid-ocean ridge where these plates are diverging and where ocean crust is forming, each th th they're entirely made out of magma. So here's a cartoon of what the ocean crust is made up of. There's magma down here that comes up to the surface and erupts somehow. So what does it look like? Here's one of those same maps. This is one I made of a place called the Endeavor Volcano, the Endeavor segment of one of these mid-ocean ridges called the Juan de Fuca. So this map is about 400 kilometers west of Seattle because the political boundary has a, a kink at the US-Canadian border. If you go due west of Seattle, you go into Canada. So this is in fact a Canadian national park we had to get special permission to go there. And all of these little dots 
are samples that we collected using that MBARI robot. So in every case, I knew a lot about them. Uh, I made chemical analyses of them. We were able to date sediment. That's what the figure third, uh, where my cursor is right now. And many of them are places with hydrothermal, hot water, hot springs. That's why it's a national park. So this is what it looks like. Here are all those different kinds of lava, pillow lavas, sheet lavas, low bay, collapse structures. And here in the bottom one are the arms of the robot collecting samples. So I'm sitting in that control room with the joystick telling the robot, oh, I'd like to collect that. Or let's get some of this sediment. Let's push a core down into there and bring back the core. And then all the other stuff on the right is the geochemist in me. So I make isotopic measurements and I make chemical analyses. And from that, I infer what happened inside the earth to produce these things. And sitting on the top of the lava is this. So those are lovingly called chimneys or smokers. Uh, See, there's various robot sort of things for scale. The tall one in the middle, right under the word R, the letter R, is about 25 meters, let me get it right, about 25 meters tall. That's taller than a two-story house. And everything at the top of it is smoke. So what's coming out of those chimneys is hot water with dissolved minerals, dissolved metals in them. And when it says recovery, two different ships, two different oceanographic ships went here in the 1990s, determined to collect one of these things and bring them back. And if you go to the Museum of Natural History in New York, the one that's in the Central Park. One half of one of these chimneys is on display there. Mm. It weighed tons. So they had to, the ship had to lift, hoist one of these chimneys up. It, a chainsaw was used to cut it in half. Half got kept for science, half got sent to New York for public display. And here is a video clip right at the orifice of one of those hot water chimneys. So down here where my cursor is, is relatively clear water, but the black right above it is where minerals are precipitating right on the seafloor. There, that thing on the tar far left is a thermal probe that the robot has stuck down into the chimney to measure how hot it is. The blackness are sulfide minerals. And look who's living here. So you've got shrimps. I don't know what this is. Um, and, but the basis of life here is not photosynthesis. It's a, a chemosynthesis where the energy is derived from those hot waters coming out. And so this, is, this arguably is one way that life formed on Earth is the hot water coming out from submarine volcanoes. Coming a little bit further south, so where I was showing you that thing to you before was just off the top of this map on the, on the upper left. But here's Newport, Oregon, for reference. And you go due west from Newport, Oregon, and here's another one. Here's that Juan de Fuca Ridge. Uh, yeah, sorry, Endeavor, I was showing the last picture is right up here. Further south is this thing called axial cement. So it's a volcano. Here's that same shape that we saw for Loihi on the seafloor. Colors, once again, are water depth. And so these are now mapped in some detail in the last 20 years. Uh, and here's the, again, the 
people like me, chemical composition of the lava flows. And here's a lava flow in 1998 and 2011 and 2015. So this thing pops off fairly often. And it's been studied in enough detail so you know that um, uh, different, different eruptions produce different stuff. But this one now is, is an observatory. There's instruments on the seafloor in the volcano due west of Newport, Oregon. And there's a fiber optic cable that runs from those instruments to Newport. So one can see exactly what's happening there today. Uh, Endeavor is the place I showed you is the same thing is true there. It was done by the Canadians. So these are the only two places on the planet where underwater volcanoes are monitored in real time. And here's the kind of data that they can get. So that upper right, that's the same picture as the axial volcano. Here is the fiber cable coming into the floor of the volcano. The uh, nodes, those circles, are one of them is that video clip I showed you where the robot was rescuing a piece of equipment from the seafloor because it got run over by a lava flow. That's here. And on the top left, this is the temperature of the water coming out of those vents. So the temperature goes up and down with times. This is 2001 to 2016. 15 years worth of data, temperature goes up and down. And here in the bottom left is the change in the seafloor elevation. It's in meters. So the seafloor goes up and down by two to three meters as a function of time. Again, 2011 to 2000, uh, I, I, I got this one uh, six months ago, last year. So the seafloor rose, and then there was an eruption. And the seafloor sank by two meters. And then gradually it rose up again, got to about that same point. Another eruption occurred, and it sank by two meters. And as of uh, six months ago, it's almost back. So another eruption is expected in the next year. So if you're interested, there's a website to pursue it. Uh, that this is the best monitored American volcano on the seafloor. Let me, I'm gonna shift now to a, a different set of topics about things that are much more explosive. Mm -hmm. But Barry can, is there a way we can find out, are there questions in what we've said so far that someone would like to ask before we proceed? If somebody has a question, you can just unmute yourself now and ask Jim the question. Any questions out there? Yes. Ron? Yeah. Uh, we sometimes hear that the temperature of the ocean is increasing because of um, because of um, um, CO2, I yep. guess, in the air. Yep. Uh, and so how do those two uh, interact or can we delineate what is causing it as, as whether it's the volcano or the um, CO2? Right. So the amount of volcanism, even though you can see that upper left diagram here, all those red dots are volcanoes and basically along these black lines, that's all volcanoes. Somewhere along those black lines in the whole planet, there probably is one eruption going on at any given time. One in the entire planet. So the, the consequences of this, uh, of hot water entering the sea is very local. So even in those places, So even here, where there's a lot of hot water coming on the seafloor, if you move away 
<clears throat> even a few hundred meters, the temperature of the seawater is still four degrees at the bottom. So it's a very local effect. And for a volcano erupting, it's, uh, although it's happening somewhere all the time, the planet's huge. So the thermal effect of this on the overall ocean is small compared to the effect of the air above it. So that the, if, the atmosphere, if the temperature in the air goes up, the temperature in the water goes up. And the way that can be measured is the speed of sound passing through the ocean is a function of temperature. And so if, you, if we, we, it, it is done, you can compare how, uh, how long it takes noise to get from one side of the Pacific Ocean to the other. And that has changed in our lifetime because the overall temperature of the Pacific Ocean has risen. And, and so that's the argument why it is anthropogenic, it's human related, it's not the volcano. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, this is Joel Primack. Uh, if I understand correctly, this uh, fine grain sand, uh, the black stuff that you were talking about, which I think you call clast, at least in a certain size range, uh, is indirect evidence that uh, the emissions from these undersea volcanoes are sometimes explosive. Uh, the uh, bubbles uh, actually come out and that's what's making uh, the, the fine grains. I think that was implicit in what you said, Jim. And I just wanted to make sure that I understand and that's what uh, you're really saying. Maybe you can clarify. Yeah, so in, in, this, in this particular slide, Joel, um, or let me go to this one. So here, these, the difference between the filled circles and the unfilled circles is size of these tiny little bits of glass. Uh, in order for the host liquid, the magma, in order for that to lose integrity, it, you, you need to fill the space, fill the void, which is about 75, 80% bubble. And by the time it's 75, 80% bubble, what's left, the other 20, 25% just flies, it completely loses physical strength. And so all you get are the walls of the bubble, the little glass shards. But anything less than that, you just get a glass bubble with holes in it. So Have you actually seen the uh, images of this happening? The, these little explosions occurring? Yep, uh, we're gonna get there in just a minute. Okay, one question from Choya. Um, <clears throat> so I had actually a question regarding the, the robot that goes way deep down there. So it has to withstand pressure and it has to withstand all the heat because it's got those probes going in. So was that also designed by um, the Imbari people? Because that requires a whole different set of technology. So I was just kind of curious because that's the that's where the input comes in, right? So that's the input right. has to be has to be totally, totally accurate. So, so that, that's what this in this this is a cartoon, but this thing where I, my cursor is running around is somebody's robot, and that is a, a tether that's going back to the mothership. But this in this case where these things are west of um, Seattle is about two thousand meters deep. Yep. And that's and they these things can go to six thousand meters deep, and they have exploded because they could not withstand the pressure. So it, for Mbari, they have a tank at, at Moss Landing where they can artificially increase pressure and test out instruments. And the reason why Mbari is at Moss Landing is because engineers can take instruments out into the canyon where the water depth is more than 4,000 meters, test it out to see if it works and come back for dinner. You know, that's, oh, it's, good. A day, it's a day commute, but they're constantly interacting, building things, test, did this work? Uh, just, just imagine the electronics to uh, operate. Uh, if right. you've ever left your, uh, the key to your your modern car in your swim trunks when you went swimming, it doesn't work. 
after that. So you've got to build things that can withstand seawater, that right. can withstand pressure. And it's a huge task. And for if you're inside it, you have to really trust <laughs> that they did it right. Yep. OK, thank you. I just was, I was kind of curious about that. Thank you. All right, let's go on to uh, where Joel's question was going. So I'm back to this map in the upper left. <clears throat> so we've talked about the mid-ocean ridges, uh, and we've talked about Hawaii as something in the middle of a plate. Now I'm going to shift to all this circumpacific ring of fire, all the red things. So most things that we think of as volcanoes are related to the pushing of the ocean floor back into the earth. And that's what the diagram at the top right that all the complicated stuff. But here's the idea uh, over on the right hand side is uh, the open ocean. On the left hand side is an island arc like Japan or Tonga, places where there are volcanoes. Uh, and those volcanoes overlie the pushing of the, the oceanic plate back into the earth. And there's lots of volcanoes, lots of earthquakes that occur. This is, this is my whole life, is this diagram of all the different aspects of it. Uh, the big earthquakes, the ones that cause tsunami, are up in the shallow part of it. And underneath the volcanoes, the ocean crust is about 100 kilometers deep. Well, the ocean crust it here in blue, that, that's rock that's been sitting under the ocean. And that means it has absorbed uh, ocean water, either back there at the mid-ocean ridges where a lot of hot water is flowing through it or just sitting under the ocean and getting altered as a result. But when it gets pushed back into the earth, that water gets squeezed out. And it's the squeezing out of the water that contributes to or literally directly causes uh, most of the earthquakes. So where does the water go? Well, it rises up, it's, it's buoyant, it rises into the overlying part of the earth called the mantle. But remember, it's 100 kilometers underneath most of these volcanoes, but it causes that rock, this part of the earth, to melt. It's a flux, it lowers the melting point. So whereas the, it would not be molten if it weren't for the water that came off this uh, oceanic crust, because the water came off the oceanic crust, the rock melts. And that is the cause of the ring of fire that brings that magma back to the surface. But the magma's got water in it. It's got CO2 in it. It's got sulfur in it. And that stuff wants to come out. Um, again, the pictures that we've all, that you've seen in the news of the Soufriere on St. Vincent a couple of weeks ago was a, the most recent big example of that. Most of us here are old enough to remember the eruption of Mount St. Helens 30 years ago. That was a, that, that mushroom cloud was all this water that had been pushed back underneath uh, the west coast of the US and came out catastrophically. Sometimes these volcanoes are right at sea surface. So the one on the upper left is where my daughter lives mm -hmm. in the North Island of New Zealand called White Island or in Maori, Fakati. And it was in the news two years ago because you remember some tourists got off a, a cruise ship and uh, climbed, to, were taken by a helicopter in, or boat, I'm not sure, both, uh, onto the island and had the misfortune to being in here for the uh, 15 minutes when it erupted and many of them died. Uh, this one on the top right in Tonga the, the, is a short lived island. The volcano rises right up to the sea surface periodically blows up this way and then the sea winds again and takes it back. And the spot, the one down here, uh, is uh, in Japan. So it's another one of these very near sea surface islands. So that it's a big volcano. Most of it's underwater though, but every now and then an eruption occurs. This is taken from an airplane, obviously. This is the same place where a Japanese ship, uh, a Coast Guard ship, uh, 
saw evidence that there was uh, something funny happening, the ship came too close. All of this uh, gas coming out of the volcano entered the sea, reduced the density of sea level, of sea water. It became froth and the ship sank. Mm. Everyone aboard died. Mm. <clears throat> so ships don't go close to these near surface volcanoes anymore. So that's one of the things that can happen when the volcano's right at the sea surface. So now here's some video from uh, a family on a yacht in the, 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 the glorious South Pacific. And they started seeing all of this scum on the surface of the Pacific. They kept on sailing and the scum get, kept getting thicker and thicker. And now they're completely surrounded <laughs> by floating rock. It's all pumice. There it is up on the deck of their boat. <laughs> and here they are. They're on their way from uh, Tonga over to Fiji. And They're sailing through a sea of pumice. So here's another example. Pardon me, there we go. Nope, back. Here's another example uh, a few years before that. And uh, Kermadec is the name of the islands just north of the North Island of New Zealand. So here in the top left at the tip of that arrow, these are satellite photographs. Top, tip of the arrow is an underwater volcano. You wouldn't see it. It's uh, almost a thousand meters deep in the ocean. And this is when it began to erupt on uh, July 19. And so this is gas coming off the sea surface in the direction of it going northwest in the direction of, of the winds blowing that way. The top right is a week later satellite photograph. And all this curly Q stuff is pumice, just what those people were sailing through. So now it's the ocean currents, not the wind that's blowing the pumice around. And then it, a week later, it's pretty much all broken up and so on. Well, this all that pumice came from a volcano that was 700 meters below the sea level. And it made a raft of pumice three and a half meters thick. So deep water eruptions, Joel, can at least produce inflated material, uh, inflated enough that it, uh, at the sea level, will float. But can magma literally explode? Can you get to that 80% bubbles where um, uh, the, the magma has no strength? Because I grew up believing that uh, it was all going to be pillow lava. So in 1989, I was on that drill ship that I showed you the picture of. And we were drilling uh, in the floor of the ocean south of Japan. And we found this stuff that's in the, in the left. Um, so if, if I can guide you through this, if you can see my cursor, in the upper left of this thing, it, it's a black area with a little hole in it. So that's all volcanic glass. So that's a, a, a shard, a, a clast uh, of quenched magma, quench liquid, with a bubble in it. In the right half, right top quadrant, is actually a piece of rock. So this is a lava, the same sort of thing that found on Hawaii. But it's also got lots of bubbles in it, as well as crystals. But the rest of the field of view is just individual bubbles and individual crystals. And we had been at sea for a month and the 
food on the boat wasn't really all that good. So we were really hungry for good food and we saw this stuff and we called it a chocolate mousse because it was frothy in the same way that a mousse is frothy. But we didn't know what to make of it. We knew that it had been found in the ocean almost 2000 meters deep. There was 135 meters of the stuff. And it wound up as the cover photograph in Science Magazine because we interpreted it, make, making, almost making this up, inferring that it would be possible for something like this picture in the top right to occur. And again, this is where Joel's question was going. So in this picture, the red is magma. The little black things up, up here in smoke are pieces of rock, individual little shards of glass, bubbly glass, being blown outward from something. And we inferred that this was possible. And it took quite a long time, uh, six months or more of arguing between the editor of science and the reviewers, whether they would publish that idea. They, they obviously did, because there's the picture. Yeah. No, I want. Can somebody tell me how I can advance my slides with pictures of people covering them? There you go. So, jump forward now to uh, just after the Obama was elected in two thousand eight, and there's a ship sailing from Fiji to Samoa, trailing in the water uh, some uh, measurements of the water column. Amongst them, how turbid, how clear is the water? And the, uh, another was free hydrogen in the water. And they, weren't, they were just, they had to go from A to B, and so they had a skeleton crew, but they noticed that at mid-water depth, the water suddenly turned uh, more opaque, uh, more turbid than usual, and there was free hydrogen, and they had enough sense to recognize that that is often a sign of an underwater eruption. So they, they found various people, including me, to give the coordinates of where they were and ask if anybody knew about any volcanoes in the neighborhood. And I'd worked out there for a long time, and I, I knew from Russians who had been there that there, was a, that there were volcanoes or that there was young volcanic rock and that some of it was quite interesting, special rock. And as luck would have it, a, a, a two weeks later, there was a big national meeting in San Francisco. A bunch of us got together, tried to say, let's produce a, a proposal to get a ship back there as soon as possible. That was, again, the stimulus package in the first month of the Obama administration when there was money for things that were quote, shovel ready. And as a result, a ship went back to Samoa six months after that first discovery. I was teaching, I couldn't go, mm -hmm. but they uh, left Samoa. I, I, I talked to them uh, every day on the phone and would report that information to my class. Uh, they dropped that, a submersible in, at the spot, X marks the spot, and this is what they saw. So this is the first time humans ever observed an answer to Joel's question of explosions occurring, in this case, at 1,200 meters. The credits take longer than the movie. In fact. <laughs> So, so here's the robot, that's the submersible on the left. Oh. This is a pile of rubbly lava on the seafloor. And this is the magma exploding out of the pile of rubble. That's the picture I had shown you earlier with just fragments of things flying all through the air.
and showing that all those things I had taught for years, that you, all you could get was pillow lava on the seafloor, was wrong. So here it's, now this is stop frame. This is slowed down so you can see it. So the magma is coming out onto the seafloor, forming a bubble that's almost a meter in diameter. And then the bubble implodes, collapses on itself, and sends all these fragments of bubbly things Uh, outward. So this is the first time that anybody actually observed this stuff to occur. Now, here's that a, a temperature probe. There's the robot putting its little uh, titanium rod in to measure the temperature. The temperature actually turned out to be hotter than Hawaii. Here's a, a, a geology hammer. This is a, a very frothy rock. So all these rocks came back to, to Santa Cruz. I studied them here in Santa Cruz. Uh, and it turned out to be this very rare thing called the bononite, which is, turns out to be quite important for how continental crust forms. All right, to wrap up. So all that to say is it, it uh, explosive volcanism does occur. It especially occurs in the Pacific Ring of Fire because there's all the water that has been pushed back into the earth. Uh, that rose out of the subducting oceanic crust into the overlying mantle of the earth, caused that mantle to melt. The melt came to the surface with more water than it could hold as it approached the surface. And that leads to Mount St. Helens and it leads to these things under the water. Uh, this is my most recent expedition uh, five years ago on a, on a German oceanographic vessel. Once again, all the colors are water depth, the, the, Red things are places where we collected rocks. I spent about six weeks at sea doing that. And this is the upper left is what has been done for 150 years to collect rocks off the ocean floor. It's called dredging. So it's a big metal box with teeth on it that you drop over the edge of the boat, drag, the, drag it alongside or behind the boat. Uh, it picks up rocks. They wind up in this chain link bag uh, dangling from the edge of it, and that brings it back to the uh, deck of the ship where eager people are waiting to pick it up. Here I am holding a piece of it. Some of you know my wife, Catherine. This is my daughter who lives in New Zealand where she's a medical doctor, uh, her husband, her two children as of five years ago. So I, I just uh, this past week, uh, we published one paper from that expedition and another one we published in February. So it's been a, a lot of the last year or so of my life. And this is my favorite underwater volcano. And it's the first one that we visited with that ship on that expedition. Uh, the New Zealanders have been busy mapping their, their underwater land because there's more of New Zealand underwater than above. And in the course of doing that, they found all kinds of underwater volcanoes. There's a little box right there. And uh, they started labeling them ABCD, and then they started labeling them for famous New Zealand geologists, and they ran out of famous New Zealand geologists. <laughs> and uh, so I got one name for me. And I'm going to skip this, except to say that uh, my, uh, I, the last time I used that drill ship, we drilled uh, in uh, areas south of Japan, and we thought we were going to find a lot of lava. And we found none. And we didn't even find much pumice. We didn't even find those coarse uh, millimeter sized glass shards. What we found was mud, 1.3 kilometers of mud. And that was a big bummer until I came back to Santa Cruz. And the top left is a grain size analysis of it. So the mud turned out to be mostly 20, 30 micron glass shards. And here's what they look like. So each of those are these, just like I showed you in the moose. These are tiny pieces of volcanic material that has completely blown apart. Here's just the rim of one of those vesicles. And the geochemist in me uh, demonstrated that they all 
erupted, that all this stuff erupted right where we found it. And that there was you know, 1.3 kilometers of explosively formed material in these uh, circumpacific ring of fires. So uh, thanks for hanging in here with me. Um, I started with a quote about uh, what drives science and it's just the wonder of the universe. And in this case, most of what's under what's our, on our planet has the ocean in, on top of it that prevents us from seeing it. So we're just discovering things now that have been here forever. And the submarine volcanism is what makes up most of the crust of the earth. And it does affect uh, the, the chemical composition of the ocean. And it, those sulfide black smokers are produced most of the metal deposits that we uh, use. And now we can actually monitor some of these volcanoes, even witness some of them. And it turns out that they produce things that are just as explosive as what happens um, in sub, sub aerial eruptions like Matt St. Helens. So let me stop there, Barry. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Um, so I think we'll, we'll go to a gallery view here. And if people have uh, questions, uh, I'm sure Jim is open to some questions. We have a little bit of time for questions here. Yes. I see any hands or unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Well let, well, let me ask one. What was it like being on the Alvin? That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> one of my undergraduate students uh, back in the 1970s was a woman named Kathy Sullivan. She's become <laughs> quite uh, uh, well known in Santa Cruz as the second woman to walk in space. So when that happened, because she, her, her PhD was in oceanography. And when she did that, I thought, gee, if she can do that, at least I can go to the bottom of the ocean in a submarine. So I set out as, with that as an ambition and uh, indeed did that. And I'll tell you one story, Barry. Uh, it was in Japanese national water. So we had Japanese scientists on board. And there's in, in the Alvin, unlike uh, other, other countries, submarines, scientific submarines, there is one pilot and two scientists, not the opposite. So the scientists have to know how to go home if the pilot has a heart attack, so let's say. So we're, you're, you're set in the water, they take off the rope and you sink on your own weight. And you're, you know, there's no way back. You're just going down unless you flip a switch and the, the weights fall off the bottom. And there are four portals at, uh, tetragonal distances for the strength of the titanium sphere. So the pilot has one and each of the two scientists have one. So the pilot, a laconic uh, na ex-Navy pilot, turns to the Japanese guy next to me and said, oh, we changed the window there by your foot last night. Let me know if you see any water. <laughs> And the poor guy, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if it was in translation or it was his first experience being in an album, and he went catatonic. He was in a fetal <laughs> position for eight hours. <laughs> wow. So it is scary. And they, in order, before you're allowed to go into the sea, you're put into Alvin on the deck of the ship uh, for an hour with, with hatch closed to make sure you don't freak out. So it, it was electrifying. It was terrific. Okay. Other questions for Jen? Bob. Yeah. A subduction zone is shrinking the area of the Earth. I imagine the Earth is staying much the same size, though trivially it would shrink, but it's got all kinds of heat generation inside it anyway. So got an opinion about the size of the earth changing. Yeah. Well, it, it, Bob, that was a huge scientific question when plate tectonics was first being uh, thought up in the 1960s. And there was vigorous debate about how could you tell whether the radius of the planet had increased with time or decreased with time. It, 60 years later, it's now clear that it doesn't change. 
and that there's a balance between what is produced at those mid-ocean ridges of new oceanic crust and what's destroyed at those subduction zones. And now it's apparent that it's the, as that stuff gets pushed back into the earth, uh, it becomes denser. And it's the bottom of the plate that's now being pushed into the earth that's pulling the plates apart back at the mid-ocean ridges. So there's a force balance and a mass balance. So your right. rotation rate would also change if uh, there was significant effect, right? Thank yeah, you. Yes, I mean, the planet's rotation, yes. Jim, could you talk a little bit about seafloor mining of minerals? So those, those uh, sulfides that you saw being formed uh, have economic value. And uh, it, it varies with the place as to what the economic value is. But the closest thing there is right now to actual mining on the seafloor is in New Guinea, where what's being formed on the ocean floor is very rich in silver and gold. Mm -hmm. And it's close enough to land that it's technically possible to have a conveyor belt that takes the stuff oh off gosh. the floor of the ocean and brings it onto land. Now, the stuff is forming as fast as you could mine it. Ah. So talk about sustainable. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's the it's the environmental consequence of it that's the issue. And because obviously, if you're that clam or squid or somebody living down where that is, the the, the water is going to get very turbid, and it won't help if you get into the wrong conveyor belt. Uh, so it's it's technically possible to do, uh, but no country. New Guinea is the closest to actually permitting it to be done. Um, the, the biggest thing for seafloor mining though, Ray, is not what I've been talking about, but it's what are called manganese nodules that form mm -hmm. extremely slowly and that are largely in the Western part of the Pacific. And they are rich in rare earth elements, mm -hmm. which otherwise China controls, right. or cobalt, which otherwise um, the Congo or Zimbabwe controls. So there are things in those manganese nodules that have enormous geopolitical significance, but they're in really deep water, like 5,000 meters of water, and they're not near land anywhere. So the potential for them to be mined is, the, the, the reason to mine them is even greater, but the problems in doing so probably certainly have, are nowhere near being solved. So I'm going to have a follow-up on that, you, the geopolitical part. The, the, the New Guinea, is it Papua or is it the Indonesian? And is it the Chinese influence? Because they need the money to dredge all of that. So where is the funding coming from? It's, it's the Papua New Guinea part of it, not the Indonesian part. Right. It's, it's on the- So the Australians? East, east, east end of um, New Britain. Mm -hmm. So the, the money I think is largely Australian. Uh, just my, I just feel, whoa, I feel a sense of relief. That's all. <laughs> not, not to say which side I'm on, but just a good sense of relief. Thank you. Uh, okay, maybe, uh, well, we'll let Roger have the last question, then we'll turn it over to Benita. Roger? Oh, okay. Uh, I, I want to follow up uh, a little bit more on the discussion of the, the undersea vessels. Uh, I sense from your talk that um, the remotely controlled uh, vessels were safer, were uh, cheaper, were probably more versatile. Yep. And, uh, we, we see a real parallel with that in the, explore, in the exploration of Mars, where we also have the robotics and we can do it, but there's always this push to have humans uh, go and do it, at least among some political areas. Could, could you comment on that? What is the yeah. future of, on, of underwater exploration? It's, is it going to be robotic or is it still going to be people uh, in, in, in little boats way down deep? I think for science purposes, it's, it already is almost entirely robotic. And that the only, it's, it's a bit like Mars or Moon anyway, where it's people, it's the Jeff Be Bezos's who've got the money or the Elon Musk's who are doing it as, a, as an ego thing. 
So the, the same thing is true in the oceans. Uh, one of those same people has, has now gone uh, nine kilometers deep in the ocean uh, and will take you, Roger, with him if you pay him <laughs> enough money. So I, for scientific purposes, I think the days of manned exploration of the seafloor is over. Thank you. Wow. Okay, Bonita. Yes, well, I want to thank everyone who was here today. I'm sure you enjoyed that, it was fascinating. I'll never feel the same the next time I go to Hawaii and look <laughs> out at the water, I will never feel the same. So this was a terrific talk, thank you so much. And I want to um, remind everybody, be sure when you get the email to go and vote. I feel like I'm back in a political campaign, <laughs> but it is time to vote on the new slate of board of directors for Ollie. So thank you again, be safe out there and we'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you.